Oh, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, a survey by the National Commission for Civic Education, NCC, reveals the issues that matter most to Ghanaian voters ahead of Election Day, December 7, 2024. We'll run through it and, and show you exactly these issues and why they are of, of major concern to the Ghanaian voter. And we'll juxtapose it with other polls as well uh, that also give a pointer of the thinking of the Ghanaian voter going into this election here on your election command center. And a lot of the polls and forecasts have been talking. And if you want to be convinced, well, don't look at one poll. Don't look at one forecast. You can expand your tentacles and bring in a few others. And, and they are pointing to a certain direction. So here's what we're going to do here on, on Ghana tonight. Here on your election command center, some 44 days, election day, December 7. The Economic Intelligence Unit, EIU, has been involved in you know, forecasting and also doing some analysis ahead of every election in this country, at least since... Since 2002, this, they, they, they announced their presence in this country. EIU's forecast ahead of election 2024, based on the details of their report that we, they, they released in April 2024, a summary of it I'm going to put on the screen right now. They say, quote, ongoing public dissatisfaction, infrastructure development, job creation and easing of corruption will trigger anti-incumbency factors. The NDC, therefore stands a reasonable chance of winning the 2024 election. That's the EIU forecast on election day 2024. Okay, so if, if you want to contest the EIU, well, over the period, they've had majority of their forecast actually coming to fusion. Beyond the EIU, the Economic Intelligence Unit, which is this UK-based research, research firm, there's another UK-based research firm that has also put out a forecast. And this time around, it's, it's Fitch. Fish solutions also, from what we do know, beyond just the economics and also the, the grading of, of our you know, economy and uh, also matters relating to our external, as it were, viability to external investors. They also get into our governance issues. Fitch put out a forecast just earlier this month, in the month of October. Here's what the Fitch report for Ghana is saying. Fitch says, quote, in terms of the December 2024 general elections, we think that the NDC opposition is most likely to win. That's a fresh report, right? Beyond this, if you look at these two external reports painting a certain picture, let's bring it home and find out what the Global Info Analytics, that's a locally based research firm, We've been doing quite some work ahead of this election, doing over, at least over the last four years, gauging the mood ahead of election 2024. This is it. So to keep the EIU in mind, keep the Fitch in mind, and this is what the Global Info Analytics voter choices, at least for the month of October, this is the report that they put at the national poll for the month of October, as was released in the first week of October, uh, that's some three weeks ago, almost three weeks ago. Take a look at this. According to the over 8,000 persons that they polled across all the 16 regions of the Republic of Ghana, with a margin of accuracy of about 99.3%, and a margin of error just a little over 1%, this is it. 51.1% of the respondents said if elections were held in October, their decision was that they're going to vote for John Dramani Mahama. And 37.3% say if elections were held in October, they're going to vote for. Dr. Mahmoud Obamia, 4.1 for Alan Chimantini. And guess what? Take a look at Nanakwa Mbediako as well, because as you've been following us here on Ghana Tonight, we've showed you the trajectory of his ascendancy in terms of the, the persons who are gravitating towards him, at least in the Global Health Analytics polls. He's looking at some 6.2 the as of October, if elections were held in October. And if you look at the regional breakdown, based on the, the details of this Global Info Analytics survey. We put up the Ghana map here, and I wanted to pay attention to the green and the blues because it tells a story. According to the October polls, John Mahama, based on the outcome, 
had 12 regions voting for or deciding to vote for him. That is the 12 regions where the respondents were spread. Upper West, Upper East, Northern Savannah, Bono, Bono East, OT, Volta, Greater Accra, Central, Western, and, and Western North. Based on Global Info Analytics polls, for Dr. Mahmoud Obamia, he had there have for Ashanti, Easting, and the Northeast region. Northeast is, is his home region. You see the Savannah region as well uh, being painted green or, or turning green based on the Global Info Analytics polls as we have it. Now, there are key areas that you must also pay attention to, and, and these are the swing regions. So you look at the central region turning green now. And you look at the Greater Accra region as well, down there, see, turning green now. And also the, the central region, based on the Global Info Analytics polls, also looks green, at least for the month of October. Now, we're going to find out whether the factors that led to these voters taking a decision in the month of October are going to change in any way to have them change their decision on who to vote for because this is how the picture looks like right now based on the outcome of the global info analytics and they are not alone in this so we asked the question and we found out from global info analytics what really informed the decision of these persons who were surveyed on who they're going to vote for so they asked a few questions and there were a number of issues that you will, you will see. And at least between July and October, based on the trend analysis and change, you've seen that there hasn't been so much of a difference in terms of the changes between July and October for John Dramani Mahama. still around 51%. Now, if you look at Dr. Mahmoud Obamia, between July and October, in July, the Global Info Analytics survey indicated 38.2% of the persons surveyed, just around the same figure, about almost 10,000 said we're going to, if elections were held in July, 38.2 said we're going to vote for Jota Mahmoud Obamia. Fast forward to October, that's dropped to 37.3%. That's 0.95% decrease. Lanchamanting is seeing a, a decline as well. Nana Kwam Bidiako is seeing an increase of plus 1.63%. That's the story if you do a month-on-month -month analysis for these at least four candidates that we're talking about and looking at right now. So what are the issues that inform the decision of these persons who were surveyed on who they are going to vote for? And this is it. And pay attention to it closely. These are the five major issues. The economy, jobs, education, healthcare, roads, economy. Economy remains number one. 70% of the respondents say the economy is going to be the major issue they're going to look at. 62% say jobs. And there's a reason why. Because we're seeing the unemployment Statistics certainly don't look good. The Ghana Social Service has been consistent about that. 48% education, 25% healthcare, 24% roads. And bear in mind, this government has declared the, the year of roads over an, a couple of years now. And, and we're seeing some road infrastructure also taking shape, at least in the last few months gone by, uh, and what we're seeing on our roads right now. But as to whether that's potent, to influence a change in the decision of the voter, that's another conversation that we're going to be having as well. So this is based on Global Info Analytics, the first five key factors that would influence voter choices. Now, the National Commission for Civic Education, NCCE, as well, they did a survey to find out what are the key issues that would influence voter choices. And take a look at this. Not, not so different, but just that the, the rankings and the positions change. For the NCC, education was number one for those they surveyed. And, and here's the reason why. If you look at the dynamics of the survey population and their demographics, the age population that the NCC surveyed, where, where mostly a number of the young people, you know, first time voters, and so education will be of top priority to them. For Global Info Analytics, they had more of the graduates population, the 24 to, to 35, 24 to 40 age bracket. And that's why for them, the economic situation is of interest to them, right? But for the NCC, they had education number one. Employment, 
It's number two, jobs. And for the global info analytics, you saw jobs coming in as number two. Healthcare was number three for the NCC. But if you look at global info analytics, healthcare came in number four. Because for the dynamics, you had a lot more of the older population also thinking about their health as well. So if you look at the, the, the breakdown of the, the survey dynamics, you would understand why. And then for the NCC, economy came in as number five. But in summary, all these five issues in these two different surveys are actually almost the same and just interchanging positions. Then the question was asked, which candidate can address the key issues that were outlined? That's the jobs, the economy, education, roads, health. 44% of the respondents said they trust John Dorani Mahama to do that. 37% said Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya. That's how the picture looks like right now, right? And so keep this in mind. But then again, beyond, beyond all of this, we, we hit the streets earlier today to interact with the voters, at least on the streets of Accra. And we'll do this across the country in the coming days here on Ghana tonight. And this is what some of them had to say to us. Our road network and then um, health sector. I mean, our roads are really bad and then our health areas too is just a lot of loops. Well, honestly, I wouldn't answer that because I'm not even voting. Even if I'm to vote, all the factors that you mentioned are effects of, of whatever that is happening. There's nothing that will make me vote, honestly. You, you appear to be disappointed in NDC and MPP, but there are other options no, like I'm, I'm the New Force and the other... I'm disappointed in NPP the most, yes. So... So that's why you should even vote, don't you think so? <laughs> because if you don't vote, it means that it's a vote. Well, I support the NDC. If I'm to vote, I'll vote for NDC, but I'm not voting. For me, based on uh, economy, and uh, based on uh, uh, corruption, based on uh, unemployment, because we are youth, as my age now. Masa, I, 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 we don't save. Things that we are buying for five CD, even common kinky, we are buying for three CD or two CD. Now it's five CD. Five CD, crowd, when they give it to you, Master, you chop it, you will not satisfy yourself. Even common according the fruit that we eat to satisfy, to let uh, the things that we eat to be digest fast, is up. Among these issues mentioned, I think our road and lack of employment. Yeah, our roads are very bad. If you take a car to work, you suffer. And sometimes if you go to the roadside picking a car, it's very difficult. And Things are costly nowadays, we can't afford. So I think the NPP government, years back we were so happy to have him on power, but now he has really, really disappointed us. I think employment is key because most of the news I've seen, most of the videos I've seen on uh, our social media today, most people complain of unemployment a lot. And the there are a lot of people who have graduated since like five years, some up to seven years. Some I know personally are still unemployed. And well, those so were some uh, members of the general public there. In fact, the voters who are sharing their thoughts with us here on your election command center. Let's, let's go on to Zoom right now. And uh, fortunately, we've been joined by Professor Patrick Asumi. He is a, an associate professor of economics at the University of Ghana. Also, Musa Dankwa uh, is the executive director of Global Info Analysis. Gentlemen, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Great. And, and also to you, Musa Dankwa, can you hear me? Right. I'll start off with you, uh, Pro Pro Professor Suming. Uh, it's, it still boils down to the bread and butter issues, is it not, for a lot of these persons that we've spoken to? Absolutely. I think, you know, the economy always plays an important role. In time past, there's, there's 
it's an economy, it's the economy, but maybe the focus will be on things like employment. I think especially the 2016 election, there was a lot of focus on employment. This time, and quite understandably, because of where the economy has been in the last couple of years, I think issues about the economy is really top on the agenda. Um, so it, it's not surprising at all. I think, you know, times are hard and, the, you know, people need to survive. So I'm not surprised at all that the economy is high on the agenda of voters. I see. And over time, at least for the last one month or so, consistently you've had government officials talk about the economy improving and, and almost trending towards pre-COVID conditions as in indicators for that matter. From where you sit, how do you analyze this? I think it is the case that the indicators are looking better. Uh, but you have to say better compared to which period, I think. Compared to 2022, we are in a much better place, but I think it's, it's too much of a stretch to say, you know, the economy is looking as healthy or approaching the kind of health that we had in the 2019 or 18 or in that period. I don't, we are far from that. I think, you know, I think one, my, one of the problems is the over-reliance on macro data without doing a little bit more disaggregation to understand what is behind the numbers. Mm. So, for instance, we've seen one of the things that you hear is that, well, since inflation peaked uh, at 54%, just over 54% in December 2022, it has fallen continuously to right around 21 and a half or so. That, might, that is true. But even in that period, the cost of living has risen upward of 43%. Even if you just count from 20, the end of 2022 alone, where we say inflation has come down, and that's true. But you notice that even in that period, the cost of living has risen 43% and over. So I think sometimes, when you rely on the numbers and you you don't look too far too much into the disaggregation, you you just get a rough sense of where the economy is headed. Then the other number, the big is this, is the growth rate, which in the first half of the year has exceeded expectations. Right, and it is true that the growth rate we've seen especially in the second quarter, is the highest thing for over five years. That would be the pre-COVID era. But, you know, one of the things you always want to look at is look at disaggregation and also look at primary data. Mm. So when you disaggregate the sources of the growth, you see, for instance, especially the, this year, mining has been the strongest uh, source of growth, followed by ICT, and then I think in the last reading, construction also did relatively well. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, if the economy is growing much stronger than expected, why, why does it appear that other Ghanaians don't seem to relate to whatever the macro number is saying? And right. one of the reasons is when you begin to disaggregate the growth and you begin to see which sectors are growing, then you understand why, in spite of whatever group you are seeing, you know, Ghanaians seem to feel completely different because right. if you take mining, for instance, mm -hmm. I think there's been a couple of or three or so large scale mines that have been opened. Right. And we know that Ghanaian participation, especially ordinary Ghanaians, mm -hmm. our participation in the mining sector is very limited. The same True. applies to oil. So when growth is driven by those sectors, many Ghanaians won't feel it. And, and That's not what we are seeing. Uh, right. And, and, and it, it's that point that I want to bring in Musa Dankwa now, uh, Executive Director of Global Info Analytics. Ms. Dankwa, now, with, with the polls that we've seen, and, and consistently the economy is, is, is always coming through as number one, what, what do people tell you? Reason why the economy continues to come up at least for over the last five polls as the number one uh, driving factor for voter decisions? Right, Alfred, um, 
I think if you listen to uh, Prof, it's all about disaggregation. And if you look at what they've been telling us, they've been telling us that the country is headed in the wrong direction consistently over the past uh, 34 months. And then again, they say that their living condition or the standard of living in the last 12 months has always been worse than the previously or than the previous uh, year. So the cost of living, which is linked to the economy, is the direct cost of people's some satisfaction with the current uh, uh, government. And it, it boils down to whether they are participating in the economic growth or not. Indeed, if you listen to Prof, he said the growth has been driven by the mining sector. How many people are actually uh, are involved in the mining activities? And if the big mines are the ones driving the, the, the economic growth, then it's not going to be uh, spread across any uh, by other areas of the economy where most people are engaged in. So it really is about the economy, standard of living, and the cost of living. I see. And so uh, clearly, they, they show us it's not about that kind of. I mean, taking into consideration your condition of living and, and, and vote, that's going to be the overriding consideration going into this election, is it not? Yes, it is. And indeed, if you ask people what factor would influence you most on how you vote in this election, over 55% said economy or the current economic condition would determine what or how they vote. So really, it's going to be the economy, economy, and economy. Mr. Dakwa, stay with me a bit. And... Um... This is going to lead us into our next conversation coming up next here on Ghana Tonight. We go straight to the United States and we bring you live updates from the ongoing annual International Monetary Fund and the World Bank meetings in Washington, D.C. Um, in the United States of America and exactly what the IMF has been saying with respect to uh, th their own outlook about uh, issues relating to Ghana and the sub-region. Let's, let's, let's hear, in fact, yesterday, a specific question was asked of uh, the IMF chief, and uh, that's chief economist, the question about the state of the, their own assessment of the sub-region with regards to inflation, cost of servicing, external debts, and other matters arising, and this is what he had to say. Year and a half, there's been some progress uh, in, in the region. You saw uh, inflation uh, stabilizing in some countries, going down uh, even, and, and uh, reaching close level close to the, to the target. So, but half of them are still, uh, are still at, at, uh, at uh, you know, distance, large distance from the target, and a, a third of them are still, uh, uh, are still having double-digit inflation. Uh, in terms of growth, as, as Pierre Levy mentioned, uh, it's, it's quite uneven, uh, but it, it remains too low. Uh, the other issue is, is debt uh, in the region. Obviously, we, uh, it, it, it is still high. Uh, it, has, it, has not increased, it has stopped increasing, uh, uh, and in some countries uh, already starting to consolidate, but, but it's still too high, and, and the debt service is, is correspondingly still, still high in, in, in the region. So the challenge is still there. Uh, there's been some, some progress. Uh, so in terms of the recommendation, uh, in countries where inflation is very high, uh, you would you would recommend uh, you know tight monetary policy and in some cases uh, when possible uh, help by 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 consolidation on on the fiscal side. So on this, in fact, that gives pointers on on how the outlook of the economy is going to look like. It is all about the economy, the economy conversation. Musa Dankwa is still with us. Let's cross over now live to the United States, specifically Washington D.C., where our international affairs correspondent Ibrahim. Uh, Sani Abdul is connecting with me right now, uh, monitoring and attending the IMF World Bank Spring meetings. Sani, what, what, what has been the general conversation about the world economy and especially Africa and how things are playing out now at the, at the IMF Spring meetings? Well, Alfred, largely the conversation has been around the mounting challenges that we have seen around the world, i.e., the geopolitical uh, tensions that we've seen, the wars in the Middle East, and of course the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, which continues to linger on. The impact on the global economy has dominated conversations here uh, in Washington now. Alfred, uh, largely 
uh, global finance chiefs have been looking at ways to navigate through some of these challenges. And of course, a key issue that they have also been looking at uh, has been the outcome of the U.S. election. We know uh, the kind of measures that the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, has been proposing. It will have a huge impact and a shift as to how things are being run in the global economic order. If the Democrats are lucky to maintain power also, we know how this will impact the issues of the global economy. So largely, uh, these factors that, in fact, the economy have dominated competitions here in Washington and a global finance shift and governance of central banks around the world have been looking at ways to address I see. And now you, you make the point about uh, the how the conversation about the global economy is going to impact on Africa and specifically Ghana. Now, that question about inflation, we've seen trending down, but then again, the trickle down effect, we still have prices of goods and services still high in Ghana. What has been the IMF's disposition about this? Well, the, the IMF, if you talk about what the IMF, economies just said, uh, a kind of multiple approach, they are inviting uh, managers of economies, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, to look at how uh, you can adopt the monetary policy tools, as we've seen in countries like Ghana, the central bank hiking the policy rates to mop up excess liquidity from the system. Also, if you have challenges from the supply side, I'm, I'm referring to if the inflation is largely driven by supply side challenges, you can look at supply side uh, recommendations that they have opted, maybe cutting down expenditure, trying to uh, rake in more revenues so that you could strengthen your fiscal consolidation. In terms of Ghana specific, we've seen inflation trending from somewhere 54.1% uh, in December 2022 to somewhere 21% that's the last median, and that's quite a huge uh, trend in that, that we have seen, but whether that impacts how prices are kind of moving in the country is also a different proposition. Because if you look at the dynamics and if you look at the factors that have driven Ghana's inflation, largely imported inflation has contributed significantly as a result of the shocks that we have seen in the global supply chain. And that has largely been contained now, even though the geopolitical tensions and some of the issues that have caused that actual link. So if important right. inflation is on the uh, descendancy, then largely it will impact the inflation trend in Ghana. And that's just largely why we have seen inflation coming down a little in Ghana. But the major issues affecting food prices still linger on. The government will have to do something on that regard if you want to achieve maximum benefit. Uh, Sunny, stay with me. And Mr. Dankwa, so uh, from your own uh, analysis, these factors as the economy, jobs, education, healthcare, roads, uh, the, per your trend analysis and projection, these factors are not going to change. These are the five top issues that will influence voter choices? Yes, um, it's not going to change. Um, the economy will remain number one issue for four days from today. It's not gonna, nothing is going to change. But I expect education to heighten up a bit. Uh, towards the school admissions. And normally when that happens, the heightened tend to be worried, and that worry tends to go against the government. If the, the admission process goes smoothly, without problem, people will give the government credit. But if it gets a bit messy, they tend to blame the government around that time. So you see education spiking up a bit uh, towards the uh, school process, I'm um, selecting process, and after that, it will just decline. I see. And, uh, and, and this 44 days will be enough to, as it were, flip that position that you see, jobs being overtaken by education? No. If you look at the, 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 the gap between education, economy, and job, I mean, it's a distant step in terms of the ranking. If you look at the, um, at the last October poll, uh, economy was 70%, uh, job uh, 62%. And then they can education 48 percent. It may go to around 55 or 56 thereabout, but it will not supersede economy and jobs. No, I don't see that happening. Well, uh, Sadam Kwa is still with us here. And let's, uh, on, on that particular point, let's hear from uh, Sunny. The finance minister, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, has been speaking about.
the debt restructuring and the benefits to the economy in that interview uh, yesterday. Let's hear from him. And I'll come to you on this. We started with our domestic debt uh, restructuring and the sacrifices of our people uh, ensure that we concluded uh, that restructuring with about 95% uh, or more participation. So it was greatly a success. Uh, we followed that with the restructuring of our bilateral uh, debt with our bilateral creditors. That was also very successful in a negotiation between us and the official creditor committee for Ghana. And this led to uh, significant savings, debt service relief of about 2.8 billion US dollars. And then following this is our restructuring of the euro bonds. The euro bonds, about 13 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, that was concluded in the first week of this month. Uh, another great success because we saw over 98 percent participation in the debt exchange. Um, the benefits we have derived from this so far includes an outright debt cancellation of about five billion dollars and another debt service relief of about 4.3 billion dollars. And so between the bilateral creditors and the euro bonds, you are talking about savings of about 12 billion. Well, Sonny, now ahead of that big conversation at the spring meetings concerning the state of the economy of Ghana, which I understand is going to be a press conference tomorrow, what has been your own gauging of the investor, that's external investor conversation about Ghana after this debt restructuring? Well, largely the international community here at the annual meetings are expecting that. The gains uh, we have uh, secured from the debt uh, program would be jealously guarded because this has resulted in steep losses for domestic as alluded by the finance minister in that interview yesterday. Of course, also on the external front, we have seen euro bond holders and uh, the official creditor committee helping Ghana to achieve some 12 billion gains from the debt uh, gain. And uh, if Ghana has been granted this relief, then they expect the government to be fiscally responsible so that it will not return the economy in the mess that we saw in the last few years uh, for the government to return back to investors and also ask for some sort of forgiveness or some sort of debt relief. So. Uh, if, in terms of what the international community is expecting, they expect the government to be prudent in its fiscal management, especially in the election year. We are largely not seeing that, but uh, we should not also take away the fact that Ghana is a poster boy of the fund and a lot of considerations we've seen given to the nation and that has helped in achieving what the managers of the economy has achieved in terms of the debt uh, work. So largely on Sunday, we expect the a finance minister who will be addressing the Ghanaian media to tell us more about their engagements here, what they will be doing. You are aware the last phase of the debt uh, exercise has not been completed. Right. Uh, with the uh, commercial side, they are still engaging and they are hoping to seal that very soon. So he will right. be telling the Ghanaian media what uh, he will be doing to convince these creditors to offer what their compatriots have offered to the country, Ghana, and going forward, what Ghana will be doing to avoid such a catastrophe. And I do appreciate you for this update, Ibrahim Sani Abdul, there, uh, joining us from the United States, uh, Washington, D.C., covering for us the spring meetings of the United States, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank in Washington, D.C., international affairs correspondent there, Sani Abdul uh, Rahman. I thank you as well. Musa Dankwa, thank you so much for joining us uh, as a director of the Global Info Analytics. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. We remain your election command center, gauging the mood ahead of election day, December 7, some 44 days away from today. Coming up next here on Ghana tonight, we we'll stay in the election conversation. Manifesto check tonight. We we'll returned to the Navrongo Youth Resource Center, one of the many stored multipurpose projects across the country. And we'll tell you what's happening there after the promise by the flag bearer of the MPP. Stay with us. 
Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. We remain your election command center. And settle now now for manifesto check. On manifesto check tonight, Dennis Poberi Wadam Esquire is here. Now, there's this, we had this conversation a few months ago. Yes, we right? have. We have. Where is this? Oh, we what spent are you so much time. This is Navrongo. I'm taking you home tonight. This is my hometown. I see. Yes, yeah, so we have been here before. We've kept our eyes on this. We're hoping that maybe things would get better, but it doesn't look like anything is happening ever since we visited this particular place. Upon all the promises that have been made. This is the Navrongo Youth Resource Center. Resource Center. Yes, yeah, simply they call it the Navrongo Stadium. This it's is one stadium. That is, yeah, it's dear to the hearts of the people, especially the young people. They are looking forward to seeing this up and running so that they could use it for a number of things. It's actually a multi purpose project. So, so what? <laughs> this, this yeah, so, those the, are the seats. The seats in the stadium. Yes. Has it ever been used? Um, yes, once upon a time it was used, but not in this form. So, it was supposed to be a facelift, giving it, making it a standard multi purpose. Um, facility that could be used for football, for athletics, and so these are the, the kind, track. and even events. Yes, I it started off shipping up well, but for some reason, contractors left side. So many stories around the situation. I but see. recall when the vice president visited somewhere in July, he had cause to be. I mean, he was confronted with this particular project as one of the things that matter to the people, mm. and he categorically told the Navarro Pio, there the NPPPC was also there. He said he had, um, the finance minister had instructed that some letters be written and that contractor was going to return to sites very soon. And that this hopefully will be completed before December 7. That's 44 days away? Yes. So They're going to complete this? Yes, before, before December 7. My, well, magic happens. When our, so. our colleagues on the New Day went to the area to do community manifesto, it was one of the issues that came up very strongly. Let's take a listen to that. Brief interaction when the the MPP PC was confronted with the status of this particular project on community manifesto. That we get back to the conversation. Super. Let's answer their questions now. The first question was on a youth resource center. Can you can you speak to that? Hello. I. I said emphatically that I am going to do my last rally at the Youth Resource Center. And my last rally is going to be on the 5th of December. And I still say that on the 5th of December, I am going to do my last rally in the Youth Resource Center. What? Please, 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 please. The 5th of December is just about four to five weeks away. What's the current state of the Youth Resource Center? 5th of December is just about five weeks away. What's the current state of the Youth Resource Center? Uh, the Youth Resource Center has, is in phases. The phase one is 90% complete. Yes, it is ninety percent complete, and that phase one will be completed before we go for the election. So the phase one so is what? Is it the foundation even, even, or even what? Within, even within, even within three, four weeks, when the contractor lands on the place, he will complete the project. So the contractor is not on site now. Uh, the contractor is not on site because there are legal issues. There are legal issues. Yes, with the land on the on the, on the contract. Okay. Yes. So and it which, has stalled which, the yes, work. Which we have, we have been managed to, to, to clear. So there's no longer a legal issue. It's, yeah, we've cleared it. We've cleared it. The Minister of Finance has released funds for the contractor to get back to site. Okay. And I am, I am certain that within the next few weeks, the contractor will so be on So we can site. hold you to this. That yes. on the fifth of December yes. we can come back here. So if yeah. I see. So he, he is certain. He says yes. on, on the 5th of December he would have his rally Final there. rally there. So, so, so that's, that's this... Alaji uh, Otito Achuluo. Mm -hmm. So he's the MPP PC for Navrongo Central. And I mean, clearly he's giving his word. This is not the first time the people are hearing such assurances. Even the vice president himself, MDC, uh, sorry, MPP flag bearer, mm -hmm. was there at the chief's palace and he gave the assurances. 
but we put a question to the people of Nabrongo as to whether they indeed believe that this project will be completed before December 7. I mean, our Upper East Regional Correspondent, Sayala Castro, has been engaging some people on the streets of Nabrongo. Let's take a listen to that as well. It's not possible. It's not possible because, uh, like, it's possible is their mantra. But whatever they promise to do, they have not been able to deliver. So, I can assure you, I'm not a naysayer because, like I indicated, it was good news to us that we're going to get one of the youth resource centers in our constituency. But unfortunately, they've reneged on their promise. Promises, and you cannot continue to just deceive the people. Honorable Otito, he reiterated that uh, by fifth of December, he is going to still launch his project there. Uh, his campaign, there, his last campaign, will be launched over there, and we don't know how feasible that is because um, if you go there, the contractor is no more in sight. If you go, there's nothing that is happening. The place is uh, full of wheat grass, and even. They, they seized those chairs that they last came and did. They, some of them have started rotten, and some of them too have started breaking. So we don't even know uh, as to whether it is only a uh, uh, hearsay or mouth say. Uh, it's possible that um, our honorable can complete this project before seventh December. It's possible because if you go back to some of, some of the uh, 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 U.S. Some of the uh, English countries, they only use some few days to fix something, if, if only they mean it to do. So it's possible to make this. Completing the youth resource center will, will help the uh, Navarongo people. Yes, but promising that they will complete it before December 7th is impossible. This, the gentleman says it is possible Yes, the, the days, lady says it is days. impossible. The lady says it is it's impossible. So, who's but we, 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 we wait to see how things are going to unfold because really it looks like the PC has really hung his candidacy on this particular project because it appears very dear to the people and he puts it on the line that Rightly so. I will do my final rally there. Invariably telling the people that if it doesn't happen, you can use that against me. But of course, this is manifesto check. And the verdict, as we only see, is right behind you. Oh, there's the verdict. The verdict. The is... verdict is with the people of Nabrongo Central on this project. Ah. Yeah. And in, in in the next what four weeks? Next, next four weeks, yes. The gentleman says he will do it. So miracles happen in elections, don't they? Let's see how things go. You remember across Paul Stadium? Yeah. No. Anyway, but look, the clock is ticking on this one. Dennis has some strong interest there for, for obvious reasons, and for good reason for that matter. There are a number of youth centers across the country as well, so we'll keep tabs on that one as well. Dennis, thank you so much, as always. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you for staying with us here on Ghana Tonight, on your election command center. On behalf of the rest of the team, we do appreciate your company. My name is Alfred Kansi. Have a good night.